Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. And we haven't really got much into the catabolism yet. We've talked a little bit about transaminases. We've mentioned the urea cycle. We haven't really got into the catabolism yet. And we're still not going to get there for a few videos. Um, but what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about the glucose alanine cycle. This is a very, very important cycle, especially for um, especially for muscle cells that are contracting anaerobically. Okay, so a lot of times when muscles are actively contracting, um, they're doing so without oxygen. In other words, they're not using their electron transport chain. So they're contracting anaerob anaerobically, so they're having to run on glycolysis. Okay, so we're going to mention in this video why that becomes important and how we counteract it. Okay. So one thing we have to understand is that there's a constant sort of tug of war between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein degradation. So it's a very dynamic thing. It's not like you have muscle protein and it just stays there statically. No, you're constantly degrading muscle tissue and you're constantly synthesizing muscle tissue. And let's say that your muscle synthesis uh, exceeds your muscle degradation. That would be hypertrophy. Right, And if your muscle degradation exceeds muscle synthesis, that would be atrophy. So it's a constant tug of war. And ordinarily, if you're eating enough protein and you're not working out, that would be more of a, a perceived static state where you're not actually degrading more than you are synthesizing. But at any given time, you are going to be degrading muscle proteins and those muscle proteins are going to get degraded to amino acids so our proteins are going to get degraded to amino acids and just like any amino acid right they have an alpha amine group right and that alpha amine group can get transported into the into the alpha amine of glutamate right it can get transported into the alpha amine of glutamate Okay? And that's important because glutamate, as we've seen, is important in the reaction of transaminases. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk about the part of the glucose alanine cycle that takes place in the skeletal muscle. Okay, so what we're going to have at first is we're going to have pyruvate, right? We're going to start with pyruvate, right? And what's going to happen is we're going to have the reaction of alanine aminotransferase. So I'll put AA. Actually, let's not do that because I already used that for amino acid. Let's, uh, my mouse works. Let's do um, instead, let's say ala A for alanine, alanine aminotransferase. Okay, so this is the reaction of alanine aminotransferase. And pyruvate is essentially going to accept the amine from glutamate, right? And so it's going to generate alanine, right? And so the glutamate is going to come in, transfer the amine group effectively, and what you're going to get out is alpha-ketoglutarate, right? So you're going to get alpha-ketoglutarate, and that alpha-ketoglutarate, as we've seen, can then go into the TCA cycle, right? Okay, and of course that TCA cycle is in the mitochondrial matrix, right? Well, we mentioned that alanine is a very important transporter of amines in the blood. And to understand that, let's actually look up the structure of alanine. So alanine is going to look like this. And notice that on the alpha carbon, it has an amine group. So that alpha amine is going to be this right there. And in fact, that amine came from the alpha position on glutamate. Okay, so that was on the alpha position of glutamate. So one of the functions of alanine in the blood is to transport amine groups. And one of the reasons this is important is because, as we, as I hope you've found in some of the other videos, is that um, ammonia is toxic, especially in large amounts. You don't just want free ammonia floating in the blood. So one of the ways that we get around doing that is we attach it to alanine, and this is catalyzed by alanine aminotransferase. We take the alpha amine from glutamate and transport it on pyruvate in the form of alanine. 
So having said that, before we go any further, one of the ways that we transport amines in the blood is alanine. That's the one we're going to discuss first. One we'll do second is going to be another transporter of, of ammonia in the blood, and that's going to be glutamine. There's a huge difference in the transportation of the amine. The transportation of the amine in alanine is on the alpha position. So this position right here, this is the alpha position. However, in glutamine, the amine is transported in the amid linkage that's on the R group of glutamine. There's the, um, the alpha amine of glutamine is not the... Um, is not going to be the direct amine donor of glutaminase, which we already have mentioned to an extent. So the actual location of the amine is different, and I hope to elucidate that for you soon. Okay, so now we're talking about alanine, and alanine can actually move through the blood. So alanine will move through the blood, and it's going to go to the liver. Right? Alanine is going to go to the liver. Now, effectively, what the liver is going to do is it's going to reverse this process. It's going to reverse this process of the transamination. So right now we have alanine, right? And it's going to reverse the process. So we're going to require an alpha ketoglutarate, right? Alpha ketoglutarate. And we're going to get out a glutamate, right? And in the process, we're going to generate pyruvate. So we're going to generate pyruvate. And again, this is catalyzed by an alanine aminotransferase. Okay. So what have we seen? Alanine goes in the blood to the liver, and alanine aminotransferase there is going to convert it back to pyruvate. What I want to mention at this point is that the actual transamination that's shown here from alanine to pyruvate, this particular reaction occurs in the cytosol, in the cytosol of hepatocytes. Remember that liver cells are also referred to as hepatocytes. Now, in the hepatocytes, the glutamate that's produced in the cytosol through this reaction can enter the mitochondria, and we will discuss the fate of glutamate in a few minutes. But suffice it to say, it will react with glutamate dehydrogenase, forming either an NADH or an NADPH, and then it will generate alpha-ketoglutarate, which will go into the TCA cycle. Okay, now we have pyruvate in the liver. Now, in order to get glucose back to the skeletal muscle, gluconeogenesis is going to occur. And if you need help with gluconeogenesis, certainly go review the playlist on that. But suffice it to say that pyruvate is going to be converted back to glucose. Right? Pyruvate is going to be converted back to glucose. And that process is just gluconeogenesis. Right? Remember in the mitochondria of the hepatocytes. Remember that the pyruvate that's produced by the transaminase must first go into the mitochondria, and there it's going to react with pyruvate carboxylase, right? And that's going to form oxaloacetate. And from there, then we can, you know, we can do various things. We can either first convert it to phosphoenol pyruvate by phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase, and then transport PEP back out into the cytosol where gluconeogenesis can occur. Or we can take pyru or excuse me, we can take oxaloacetate, react it with malate dehydrogenase in the mitochondria to give malate, transport malate across the membrane, right? And then we can use cytosolic malate dehydrogenase convert to convert it back to oxaloacetate. And then we can use cytosolic phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase to give us PEP. And then we can use gluconeogenesis on that. And if you recall from the previous videos on the aspartate arginosuccinate shunt, we found a third way to do this. We can essentially convert oxaloacetate into aspartate, and that's done by aspartate aminotransferase, and then we can transport aspartate through the membrane of the mitochondria, and then use cytosolic aspartate aminotransferase to get it back to oxaloacetate, and then we can do gluconeogenesis. But the whole point in saying this is that this process right here is going to be gluconeogenesis, and we're going to end up getting glucose back. Now, the glucose that is produced is going to essentially leave the, the cytosol of the hepatocyte, and it's going to re-enter the bloodstream. So that glucose is going to re-enter the bloodstream, and it's going to go back to the skeletal muscle, right? So now we're back on the skeletal muscle side, and the glucose, the glucose that's made is going to be converted back into pyruvate. And what's the process that does that? Well, that's the process of glycolysis.
right? That's the process of glycolysis. And one of the things that you should realize about muscles that are actively contracting anaerobically is they're largely, largely, largely running on glycolysis. And if you have a, a tissue like a skeletal muscle that's actively running on glycolysis, you must constantly feed it glucose, right? But if you're not getting glucose from the diet, in other words, you're doing amino acid catabolism, you're not getting glucose from the diet, so you have to get it from somewhere. So one of the ways that you supply the skeletal muscle with glucose is by doing this glucose alanine cycle. Okay? That's very important to understand. If you're not getting glucose from the diet, you have to get it from somewhere. It's done through this cycle. So I hope this cycle made a little bit of sense. Okay, so now before we go into glutamine metabolism, what I want to do is I want to talk about this glutamate that we generated right here. What happens to that glutamate? Well, the glutamate, like we said, can be transported into the mitochondria, right? So we have our glutamate that's in the mitochondria, right? And the glutamate can react with glutamate, glutamate dehydrogenase. And remember that glutamate dehydrogenase is technically a reversible enzyme, but under normal conditions, it only runs in this direction. So that's why I've drawn it in a one-way arrow. And in this reaction, what we're going to do is we're going to use nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or the phosphate version of it, right? And then we're going to get out either NADH or NADPH. This enzyme is unique in the sense that it can actually react with either NAD or NADP. And that's important to understand. And then in the last step, we're going to do a shift base hydrolysis and cleave off ammonia. So that ammonia will then go into the urea cycle. And in the process, we generate this very special product known as alpha ketoglutarate. And like we mentioned before, that alpha ketoglutarate can then go into the TCA cycle. And what's the enzyme that consumes it directly? Well, it's the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Okay, so now we've seen what happens to the glutamate. But we have one other amino acid that we need to deal with in terms of transporting amines in the blood. And that amino acid is glutamine. Okay, so one of the things that can happen is when you have glutamate present and amines, there's a reaction that can take place. And we're not going to do the mechanism here, but we'll do that in another video. What can happen is if we need to transport amines in the blood and we have excess amines, what we can do is we, instead of putting the amines into the urea cycle, we can actually ligate them to glutamate. So this is important. Whenever you have excess amines, or in other words, excess ammonia, remember ammonia is toxic to animals. So it, instead of just having the ability to funnel it into the urea cycle, we can actually ligate it to glutamate. Okay, and actually, why don't I do this? Instead of just drawing glue, let me actually draw out the structure just so you can see what's happening. Okay, so here's going to be our glutamate molecule. Okay, this is our glutamate molecule. And this irreversible reaction, number one, is going to burn an ATP. It's going to burn an ATP, right? And then what it's going to do is it's going to put the ammonia in right and it's going to ligate it to glutamate and in the process what we're going to do is we're going to generate glutamine right and so one thing I mentioned earlier is it's not actually the amine on the alpha position that we're transporting it's actually the amine that I'm going to do in red here it's this amine it's the amine that's tied up in the amide linkage on the R group of glutamine so this molecule right here is L glutamine so we're actually transporting the amine on the amide linkage of the R group and so that's one of the ways in which we can transport amines in the blood or we could say transporting ammonia in the blood is tied up on the R group of glutamine Okay, and one thing that we can do also when we get glutamine to the liver is we can further react glutamine. We can react it with glutaminase. So the enzyme we're going to react this with is glutaminase. This is a hydrolytic enzyme that's going to hydrolyze off the amine, and you're going to regenerate glutamate, right? And, of course, in the process, you end up generating ammonia, right? Glutaminase is a hydrolase enzyme. Let me put the water here. 
Glutaminase is a hydrolase enzyme that's going to cleave off ammonia. And in the process, we regenerate glutamate. And this enzyme, glutaminase, is expressed at very high concentrations in the mitochondria of the, the hepatocytes, the liver cells. So when you get the glutamine inside the liver, it will be transported through the mitochondrial membrane into the mitochondrial matrix where glutaminase will react with it to form glutamate. And then that glutamate that's made is going to follow the same physiology that we saw before. It's going to react with glutamate dehydrogenase. And again, we've seen this reaction before. I showed you it before. And it's going to give you alpha-ketoglutarate, and it's going to give you either NAD H or it's going to give you NADPH because the enzyme can react with NAD plus or NADP plus. And I might also mention that the enzyme that ligates the ammonia to glutamate, this enzyme has a special name. It's called glutamine, glutamine synthetase. Glutamine synthetase. And one key is that it is ATP dependent. Okay. It's an ATP dependent reaction. And so what we end up doing is we end up putting the ammonia on glutamate and make glutamine. And that's how we transport the ammonia in the blood. Okay. Because remember, ammonia is toxic at high concentrations in the blood. It's toxic. We don't want ammonia just running free. In fact, it's very damaging, especially to brain cells. So the two main ways we get around transporting it are we attach it to pyruvate to make alanine or we attach it to glutamate to make glutamine. And just keep in mind, keep in mind that we're transporting it at different positions on the amino acid. In alanine, we're transporting it on the alpha carbon. On glutamine, we're transporting it on the amide linkage on the R group of glutamine. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on how we transport ammonia in the blood. See you in the next video.